start. It's the clock. All right. Well, good evening and welcome, everyone. My name is Tracy Irby. I am the director at the Center for Women Entrepreneurs. Uh, tonight, we're having class four in our series uh, of small business training for our grant winners and anybody else that was interested in attending. Um, for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, uh, our center, we are part of the Jane Nelson Institute for Women's Leadership at Texas Woman's University. They're dedicated to preparing more women to take on successful roles in business and public service. It's three specialized centers, the Center for Student Leadership, Center for our center, Center for Women Entrepreneurs and Center for Women in Government, ensure women have the education to establish careers as successful executives, the skills for building entrepreneurial businesses and the framework needed to run for public office. Our center was funded by the state legislature in 2015 to help promote women entrepreneurs anywhere in the state of Texas. And you don't uh, have to be part of the university system to take advantage of the services that we offer. We have several of our staff on tonight. We have Donna Lisa Stinyard. She is our associate director. We have Barbara Ranke. She is our program coordinator and she is going to be on Facebook. We have Christina Mortel. She is our small business advisor, and I know that some of you have already spoken with her. Um, and let's just go ahead. I do have some good news for our grant winners. Um, the, all of the, uh, everyone who, I, who has turned in all of their paperwork, your, your, um, your funding is now in process. So I um, hope uh, it, I just wanted to let you know that that part has started and maybe in the next week or so you start, should start receiving that. All of you who um, elected for um, automatic deposit, make sure you double check there because sometimes we have people uh, say they hadn't received their funding and it has already been deposited or they put it in a different account that they thought they put it in. So anyway, uh, at the end of this, we'll have questions. Uh, if any of you have grant questions, uh, we'll go over that at the end. But I wanted to share that good news first for all of you. All right. Our speaker tonight is Linda Bullwinkle of Linda Bullwinkle Financial Services, LLC. Linda Bullwinkle, EA, MBA, has been working with small business startups for 20 years after her earning her MBA in 2003. She earned her Series 7 and 66 in 2008 and her enrolled agent license in 2017. These credentials have built on her 15 years in corporate executive positions in new product and new business development. Ms. Bullwinkle sold her tax practice in 2022 and is currently establishing a small boutique tax works, and small business support business. So Linda, we're so happy to have you with us tonight. We will turn it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me and congratulations to the grant grant winners. Um, that's, that's great. And I encourage you to continue on your journey because you're going to have many days that you're like, I'm, I don't know why I'm doing this, but if you'll hang in there, you'll get to the other side of the day and you'll remember why you're doing this. So I'm gonna share my screen if you'll give me a minute. And we're gonna talk about how to learn how to love your numbers. Uh, so, okay. So, can you see that okay? How do I make it a full? Is that visible enough or do I need to make it Full screen, that's what I'm struggling with. Can you hear that, see that okay? Yeah, you should be able to go, I think it's to the slideshow. Yeah, um, and, and I think that'll give you full screen. There we go. 
Okay, good. Whoops. Okay, I know um, from the work I've done over the years with small businesses that most small business or entrepreneurs do not get into business because they cannot wait to learn how to keep up with their financials and their books. It's usually not anything that they think about. Um, and yet it is probably the most important measurement that you should keep in front of you on a regular basis. So I'm going to go through this and if you need to stop me, stop me or put a question in the chat and we'll make sure we go over it. But I want to show you that it's not as hard as you think. They're not as overwhelming. And it's if you keep it simple, you can do this on a daily basis. So and and I and I encourage you because I think the numbers, knowing what your numbers are will lead to your success faster than anything else. So here we go. So why do you want to know your numbers? Well, first of all, the irony is that usually you start a business because either you know you've got a problem to solve, you can solve the business differently than someone else or others already solving it. Um, you want to listen or learn. You want to know why you're starting your business, which is a lot of where you are. Um, and the statistics last year were 21.7% of startup businesses fail in the first two years. The first three years are spent finding your direction and establishing your business. Path isn't straight, but you got to be willing to pivot. You got to think again, keep at it, and failure is not an option. So that's kind of how we start out. And then year three through five, every day is a challenge. And I have my own business and I've started businesses and I think this is the hardest point in a new business. It's kind of like the honeymoon is over, right? The excitement of a new business is done. And now here you are wondering why, why did I do this? And it feels like the work is never over. Your money's tight. Are you ever going to make the money that you think you're going to make? And all of a sudden you work 24 seven and your friends aren't working that way. And if you're like me, I had children and a husband and a dog who they said also complained about my hours. So this is a tough one. The three to five years are the toughest and 45 to 50% don't survive this. So this is a tough one and you really have to kind of go through with some mental toughness and this is where those numbers are the most important on a regular basis. And then you get to year six to nine or six to 10. Um, and you realize that you can't do it by yourself. You didn't get through those years. You start to have some staff or some confidence. I have done everything from uh, informal board of directors to staff, to a coach, to a good friend, to, I mean, you, you go, wherever you can to find whatever support you need, mentoring and things like that. But it's about this point in time that you'll start to think, oh, I I feel confident. I am this business. This is business is me. And I'm kind of at a point now where I know I want to be. Some people can do this in the first couple of years, but I haven't known too many that didn't burn out. So it really is more of this progression and then when you get past that 10 year mark, you start looking at, can your business be successful without you? And you start thinking about what's the sustainability because you can't sell your business if it cannot be sustained without you. So now you have to look at things a little differently because maybe that's your future. Um, one of the other things I wanna say will help you with your numbers is in year one and two, when you think about why you're doing your business, also think about how you want to get out of it someday. And I'll tell you why. If you if you want to leave a legacy, let's say you want to build this business because your children can then take it over and your family can uh, have a big family business and so on and so forth. You want to know that now. If you want to start the business because someday you want to have 
seven locations and franchise it. You want to kind of have that in your head. It, and the reason is, is the way you make decisions as you go along, you want to be making it towards that direction. If you start it and you get to year three and five and you don't know what you want to do with it, you're going to have a real hard time getting through years three to five. You got because you got to have something to look forward to. Um, I wanted to sell my business, and I wanted it to be sustainable without me. And we could go a whole day on how that works and doesn't work, and so on and so forth. But it's not as easy as you real you. I thought it was going to be. Let me put it that way. Okay, so let's go from here. We're going to start with the numbers. Um, when you start your business. You have some kind of passion and love for what you're doing. Um, I really didn't have any passion and love for taxes and bookkeeping. What I have a passion and love for is helping people with an area that they don't like, they don't know, and I knew I could make it simple. So it's not like I have, a, believe me, I have no passion for the IRS. I have no passion for accounting at, or that. It's the people I get to work with is what I like the best. Um, if you if you don't know the numbers, then all your drive and determination is, is going towards something, but you have no measurement. So you wanna have some measurement. If you know what your numbers are, you get to learn from your mistakes and you can build on it. Um, if you like, love your fellow man and lots of them and you wanna work with them, you're gonna start to feel like Oh, okay, well, maybe she can't pay for it, or I'll give you mine. Well, it's okay. I'll do your taxes for free this year. Or you start getting into a little bit of a rut, and you don't want to do that. You got to kind of keep that. So we start, number one, with who is going to buy your product or service? Where else can they buy it? And why would they buy it from you? So the first number you want to look at is who are you going to sell it to? Who's your market? And I know you guys have been going to be working on the business plans and three years of financial, but this is super important because everyone's not your market. Um, you want to have an identical group of customers. There's only so many customers. That's the first number. Okay, that's the number you want to know. Can you reach those customers? And how can you reach them? And what are the dollars it's going to take or resources? That's the next number you really want to know. And you want to keep tabs on your market and your customers. Um, prior to COVID, your market might have looked a lot different than it does today. Uh, we used to have to reach people at their offices. Now they're at home or vice versa. And we have to do it. I uh, hated Zoom. And then all of a sudden, I was thrown into a situation where I had to use Zoom. And I had to figure it out. And of course, none of the computers in my office had voice or monitors. So I had to figure that out. So you have to be able to turn quick when things happen. So your markets have probably changed and who knows, they'll change again. So you wanna know how many, you wanna know the size. Not having the experience and the skills to manage the business of your business most people don't open their business with the ideas, which I've always said. And so you're not looking at your numbers. And this is where you end up when it's time to do your taxes. So you want to love your numbers. Here we go. Let's go see where we can find them. The only way you're going to find them is to keep it simple, write it down, and work on the lowest denominator. So by that, I mean... Don't worry about the thousands of people out in the market that are going to buy your products. Start with how many people do you need to break even? You want to know it every day. And I guarantee you'll learn to know that number and love it. So most of, for most of us, the numbers are right in front of us. So we're going to have an example. So I have decided I'm going to go into the Bullwinkle Wool Sock Company. And I love socks, so I like people. And so I figured I'm going to sell socks to them. They're going to love it. They want everyone wears wool socks or needs wool socks. 
So I researched, the first thing I did was I researched the wool, the wool socks market. Yes, there really is an industry of wool socks and there's a market for it. So the global socks market to reach in the US was 61.5 billion. It'll be that big dollars by 2026. And it is aided by the rising demand from the sports industry. So now that makes no sense to me because wool socks to me are hot. So why is it sports? Well, come to find out wool is the best fabric if your feet sweat and things like that. So now I know, you know something else. So, hey, I'm going into this market, $61.5 billion by 2026. I want my share. So let's be realistic. So there's a new report now, and it gave me this forecast. So now I have a number, 61.5 billion. That's the global market for socks. Um, in 2021 to 2026, it's supposed to get that big. So what am I gonna do? I can't sell to 61 point billion dollars worth of socks. I can't even make 61.5 billion dollars worth of socks. So I have to figure out what, what can I do and how can I get there? So at least I know I have a viable market. So I'm gonna keep it simple. First of all, is there a need for wool socks? Apparently there is. <laughs> Apparently a lot of people want wool socks, but why? So I, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna target the market, not for sports, but for people who want warm feet, okay? Um, the size of the need is large, but it's not all the people who want warm feet. So who am I going to sell to? So I decided I'm going to go for old ladies over 70 with cold feet. Now I can see that because I'm almost there. So I've narrowed the scope of my market, right? I've gone from the world. I've gone from a global market to I just want women over 70 with cold feet. So where could I go find them? All right. I could go on the internet and put out a Google or a TikTok or something and sell my wool socks, or I could get a little narrower, right? And I could say, all right, I'm going to look at the nursing homes, assisted living centers, and senior centers in Denton County, because that's where I am. And how many do I want to reach? Okay. I'm going to start with, I want to reach hundreds of women. And how can I possibly narrow it that down? And my budget is $500 per month to invest in reaching them. Okay, so I have a couple of numbers there. First of all, I know my target market is women over 70 with cold feet. I know I can narrow that down to one county, Denton County. I can narrow it down to Denton County, number of nursing homes, assisted living or senior centers. I could also narrow it down to a town. I could say, all right, Denton only. So I'm I'm working with my numbers to keep narrowing it down to get something that is reasonable and doable to start. And what's my budget? I only have $500 a month that I can invest in. So if I take all that into consideration, let's see. So. I, if I could sell 100 pairs of wool socks a month and I sold them for $10, okay, I'd make $1,000 a month. And I could purchase the wool socks for $450 a pair to sell, keeping it under my $500 per month. So if you look at my simple math, I would make $550 on 10 pairs of socks if I could sell them a month. Now I have expenses, right? I have sales tax. There's merchant fees for my online sales. So I had to take that money out. So I have my income now is 454 per 75. <clears throat> What's the number I'm gonna remember every day? I have to sell 100 pairs of socks a month. And if you break that down by 30, it tells you how many pairs of socks to sell a day. So now you have a simple goal and you can measure yourself by that goal. 
I also have a number that tells me how much my socks are, right? I have to pay $4.50 a pair. Somewhere along the line, I got this information. Um, but this, I think I made it up, but we'll just go from there. So now I have a number, right? I know exactly what my focus is to keep me here. So now I say, is this what I, is this why I'm going into business for $454 a month? Is that it? Maybe I should have kept my day job. Maybe I should do something else. Maybe I should sell more socks or figure this out. But at least I have a base to start with. So this would be an example of loving your numbers. So I'm going to look at next quarter, the first four months, and I'm going to say, if I do this and I sell a thousand a month, I mean, I sell a hundred a month and I make a thousand dollars. I know what my purchases are. I obviously need some help boxing up those socks and sent shipping them out. Now, what else do I need? I probably need some advertising. I might need to pay rent. I might have a telephone expense and I have a sales tax that I know about. So you start to look at it like that. So we went from selling 10 pairs of socks. We know what we want to make. We know what we're going to pay. And now what are the other numbers we have to include? So it's still kind of basic. It's not very overwhelming. So I'm like, okay, I have to stay focused. I have to stay focused. And I'm getting really creative now with my socks. Those old ladies are going to love these socks. So now we've got the, a budget, right? This right here would be considered our budget. And this is our goal, if you will. That's your first numbers you want to like. This is the second set of numbers that you want to like okay it's cash flow this is the re number one reason most businesses get in trouble and have to close um it, and it happens all of the time we get we get ourselves all ready to start and say okay i get to start i've got this money i'm gonna start but they haven't gone through what we call cash flow to determine how are they going to stay in business while that business ramps up? Because as you can imagine, I start day one. I start tomorrow. I don't really have a hundred people to sell stocks to yet, do I? And it's going to take a little bit of time. So it might take me two or three months to find, to get going to where I'm selling a hundred stocks. So the cash flow gives us a reality check. So let's look at our reality check of week one, okay? And I encourage people to look at it on a weekly basis and not monthly basis so that you can see exactly what you could be doing. Now, granted, it looks great because week one, I sold 10 pairs of socks, okay? Probably not realistic, but it's a good example. So I week one... I sell 10 pairs of socks. I got $1,000. I have to pay for the socks. So that's $450. So at the end of the week on Friday, I have $650 in the bank. Okay. So look at the beginning of week two. So I have the $650. I only sold $200 worth of socks. But I had to pay expenses of $1,000 because I had still got socks that I'm I'm paying for it, right? Because I'm supposed to be paying for him. And at the end of the day, I have no money in the bank. Okay. This is what the cash flow is. It tells us how our cash is working. So I might have in week two had to pay for my telephone, my rent, and other items that I had to pay for. Okay. So now we go to week three. I'm in the hole. I don't have anything. So I hustle a bit. And now I've sold enough socks to get $500 in, and I only had to pay a little bit out. So now I have $150. And then week four, 
I start with $150 in the bank. Ha, huh, I have finally sold socks, okay? I am on a roll. But I had to pay for the socks. I had to pay rent. I had to pay for other things. So great week. At the end of the week, I don't have any money in the bank again. So I have to start the fifth week, going into the next week, with 300. Uh, I'm a negative 350. I got to get some income in, 1000 I paid expenses. And now at the end of week five, I have $400. Okay. You should do this for 52 weeks so that you can see where your expenses are. So for example, my phone bill is the fourth week of every month or my rent or that type of thing. And this will tell you what you need in the beginning to get through so many weeks. And that's something you have to determine. If it's 10 weeks before you get regular income, then how, how much money do you need to get through that 10 week period? And it's how we pay the bills. It's based on that. It's not unlike paying your own personal expenses. It's exactly the same thing. It's just for your business. And I think it really helps people stay on top of what their expenses are until they get a good, stable sort of rhythm going and they know where it is. It also helps you decide that you don't want to buy something or you're not going to spend money on something that week. So a cash flow is equally as important as a budget. I can work with someone and look at their and do a cash flow for them and tell them where their problems are faster than I can if I look at their budget. It just shows you where the money's going and it's not coming in. Okay, let's talk about another number. We've got, we know how much we need to sell. We've got a quantity. We know what it's going to cost us. And we have an, we're starting to have an idea of a weekly measurement for our business. So, surprise, surprise. I've been in business now for three months and all of a sudden, my favorite account tells me you have to pay your quarterly self-employment tax. It's like, what? No one told me I had to do that. Why do I have to do that? Um, you have to do that. And your quarterly self-employment tax is made up of the employer side and the employee side. If you were ever a W-2 employee, your employer used to take your taxes out. Well, nobody's taking your taxes out now and you have to do it. And it's about 16%, a little over 15. So my recommendation is take 16% out of your income and set it aside to pay for those quarterly taxes because there'll be a surprise. Couple rules of thumb. Um, people often ask, well, I didn't make much. Do I have to pay? No, but you're going to pay someday. So it's a lot easier. Let's say you owe $250 and you have a hundred. It's better to pay something than nothing because the 250 for this quarter is going to add up to the 250 in the next quarter. And then you're going to owe $500 and so on and so forth. And this is a, this is a, big surprise for a lot of people when they sit down to do their personal taxes because you will owe you will owe uh, self-employment taxes at 16 percent um, for your business and it's hard to come up with that money when you do your taxes and the IRS is does not look fondly on it being paid once a year the requirement is when we get paid, we're supposed to pay our quarterly taxes, just like when you get a W-2 check. So to a certain point, it's quarterly. When you get up to you're paying more than $2,500 a quarter, they want it monthly. But this seems to be one of the big surprises for new business owners. They'll say, but I didn't make any money. Or my favorite is, but there's no money in the bank. I understand that the IRS is not sympathetic to those excuses. They just don't like it. 
And so set the money aside now. It's a good way to get the discipline of setting it aside. So the other number, 16% for self-employment taxes. So one of the things that I also noticed as people think, this is my favorite, that, um, all right, I own my own business now and it can pay for everything. So I can go out to dinner. I can, you know, I need things for my office and so on and so forth. There still is a reality check and a reasonableness. And so I, when I work with a client and I do their taxes, I often have to explain that you didn't make any money, you, you lost money this year, but you have $7,000 worth of dining expenses. It's not going to fly. It's just not going to fly. So be smart. Um, realize that you don't want to spend your money that way anyways. You want to put it back in the business and make sure that every time you purchase something or invest like in a Let's say you have a lunch with a potential client. You keep your receipt and you write on that receipt who the client was and what you talked about. The rule of thumb is it's not a business expense unless you talk to business. You can talk business before the meal, during the meal, or after the meal. But you must have talked business. And I find it easier to start out like I do it. I write... Uh, on the receipt itself, who it was, and what we talked about, and what I'm supposed to do next. And so I have my receipts. And that's that will keep you out of trouble. If you don't have receipts, and you rely only on your credit card statement, which is okay, write it on the credit card statement. You have to have, because if you ever get audited, they're going to ask you or your representative we want to see all of the business expenses for meals and you have to be able to prove that they were for business. I keep my, I try to keep my clients from ever having to have that type of situation by telling them straight out, it's not going to fly. We're not going to take these expenses at this level. So they have a choice what they want to do, but I don't want them to get audited because of something like that. So keep your receipts, keep your notes. That's really good. The other one is mileage. That's another audit flag is mileage. Don't expect that you're just going to figure out what your mileage is. Keep track of it. Don't go buy a brand new car and say, well, my business, it's for my business and I never use it for personal. Probably not a good idea. Keep track of your mileage. There's a there's 100 apps out there now. I use Mile IQ. I like it because I don't have to pay attention to it and it tracks my mileage as long as my phone's with me. And then I go at the end of the month and say that was personal, that was business, so on and so forth. And then I have a record at the end of the year. If you don't track it with an app that gives you a record and you don't have a record, you, we used to have little books. There are these little books that you'd put in your glove compartment and you'd write down the date and the mileage and to and from, and it was a royal pain in the neck. So you don't want to do that. But if you do not have a running record of mileage, it will be taken off of your tax return. So it, they, they don't, they don't, they don't care. Um, they believe that you probably have to drive for work when in your business. But if you don't keep track of it, then it's not considered a business expense because if you worked for someone and you were reimbursed for mileage, you would have to turn in a report of your mileage, right? So you have to think of it the same way. I think of it as, I try to explain to people, just pretend that you own your own business, but you're an employee for it. And how do you want and, and track like you did when you worked for someone else? Treat it as a business. And the IRS is always looking for those things that we treat as personal and not tracking mileage, lots of meals, those types of things are more personal than if you treated it as a business. And I think that's what you kind of have to look at it. 
Um, so in 2017, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act eliminated all entertainment. And this is where I was saying you have to be able to identify all meals with a business purpose. Um, and you only get 50% deduction. So keep in mind that it's not it's not going to be 100% of all of your meals and it has to have a business purpose. So just keep that in mind. And if you put entertainment down uh, immediately, it cannot be deducted. So an entertainment is tickets to a ball game or <clears throat> any anything that you're doing you're you're giving a client or you're taking a client somewhere or you're paying for them to have some other enjoyment besides a business meeting so you really need to be careful on that one and for goodness sakes don't call it a entertainment um and so my last part of this is let me see if i can get this up for you is the biggest thing is to act like a business um, you might have heard, or maybe not, that there is an there is a review um, of are you a business or is it a hobby? And some of the things that are looked at are what I've already said: mileage, lots of meals, and you're not really making a profit, or you, you know you don't have it. You have to have business cards. And I know it's trendy to have a digital card. Um, it's trendy to have all of those things. So I'm gonna give you a heads up. The IRS isn't gonna take a digital card. So have something printed with your name on it and your business, have something. It could be your invoices to be able to show that here's your name and your address and those types of things. It could be a hat. It could be a t-shirt. It could be, I have um, pencils and pens. Um, I have business cards. I'm one of those old ladies that still has to have one, but you might want to come up with something with your name on it. One of the ground rules is, do you have printed material that promote your business? So you want to make sure you have something that promotes your business. A website does count. Uh, a brochure counts, you know, all of those things. So if you're audited, you want to be able to show that you have uh, everything is reflection. It looks like a business. Okay, let me see if I can get you all back here. Okay. So a little bit of, I think what's important is to know what your sales goals are and know where you are every day. If I have to sell 10 socks in one month and it's the 15th and I've sold three, I know what I have to do. I have to get real serious, right? I have to get super serious about getting those socks sold no matter what. And that, sh that has to be your driver. It has to be that number is your most important number. And then the second is know who your customers are and know your sales per customer. So an example might be, Janie is my favorite customer at the Pilot Point Nursing Home and she always buys two pairs of socks once a month. So I know when I go there, Janie's going to buy two. So now I've got two. I've sold three. I've got to find another five. So have those in your head. What someone, a customer is worth when you get to that point where you can start to do that. But your sales number has to be the number one number. And write it down every day. When I worked for Edward Jones, uh, it's a sales job. We're selling products to clients. I would start the first day of the month with my total and every day I would reduce the total by the amount of that day's production so that every day I knew where I was in my um, process. I could, 
I had trouble doing it the opposite way by building it up. It was easier for me to start with the total and start knocking it down. And I don't know if it was just less overwhelming. I have no idea. I just knew it was easier for me. And then I would see that amount and all of a sudden I'd be like, oh, I know what to do. I'm going to go do this. So however it works for you, you should know where you are every day. Okay, in summary, don't fail. You'll be fine if you know what your numbers are, okay? You want to know, you want to know who you're going to sell to and why. And if there's somebody else that sells wool socks, go figure out what they do and what you do better. I happen to know that the fact that I visit the nursing homes is why my set, my socks sell better than anybody else's. Okay, so you want to, and I know those ladies at the nursing home are not online to buy my socks. So you have to kind of look at it as silly as that sounds. Um, who are they and get to know them and go to them. Um, I'll give you a good example. Denton has a great chamber of commerce. When I started, I felt like it was a little expensive for me, but I was going to try it one year. Well, the year I tried it, they also were getting really serious about a woman's group. And I joined the women's group and I found my group. I found my market. It didn't take long at all for me to figure out, oh, this is what I need to spend my time on, working with women who are in business. And some of them weren't in business. They worked for a bank, but I still got them as clients. So you want to figure out where is your niche and where are you going to find them? And you go find them. It's not sitting in your office. So that's one thing I know that we are kind of accustomed to Zoom and all of that, but face-to-face -face will always, always do better. And when people find out what you do, you may never have to talk to them again or see them again, but you've met them and they know who you are. And I think people like to do business with people that they know. Know what your first year sales numbers are going to be and your costs. Figure it out, sit down, do 52 weeks, figure out what it's going to be and how much you're going to have to stay afloat that first year. And customers are numbers. I know it sounds, I know I just said people will do business with people they know, but they're really a number too. Okay, so know how many customers you need. Um, when I was in the corporate world, we sold equipment and machinery that processed eyeglasses and contact lenses. And we sold them in, uh, we, we got really good with a niche market where we sold them to like lens crafters and provisions. So we sold them entire labs for their retail spaces. So I knew we had to sell 10 labs a month to make our numbers. So part of our job was to go out and forecast with each of those clients to make sure that we were gonna sell 10 a month and it drove the manufacturing facility. And it's it's no different than what you're doing. Know, know what it's going to take and how you're going to get there, even if it's not today, but by the end of the year or the next year, you're going to get there. You'll have to have a budget because we require it and you have to have one for your financials and your business plans. It's good. It forces you to think through what you're going to spend money on and um, I'm a critic of you should never have miscellaneous. There's no such thing as miscellaneous. If you're going to spend money on it, it's something. And it fits somewhere. So you find a name for it. Because miscellaneous is the worst catch-all for a budget ever. And I've had people go, well, you know, it just might be the extra. I said, figure out where the, put the extra somewhere but don't have miscellaneous because you don't know what it is and establish your good customer base and good cash flow. Then you can set at a measured pace of how to run your business. And you might not have to be the 24 seven year five wondering why did I do this and get myself into it. And that's my sock business. And I wish you all very successful sock businesses. Okay.
I did do a little bit of budgeting here. You hate it, you love it. You can make it work for you however you want. Keep it really simple. My, I, I put this in here so that you can use it for a budget in case you don't know what it is. Because um, you'll see the words and people will sometimes will ask me, I don't know what that means. I encourage all new businesses that I work with to use Excel. Don't go buy QuickBooks. Don't go buy some other accounting software. The last thing you need to spend your time on right now is learning how to do accounting. Okay. You don't have to know how to do accounting. You just have to know how to keep your numbers. So in an Excel sheet, um, I will put the months across the top and expenses and income along the sides. And you just have to track it. So Ed, just like I showed you in this thing, I said, this is what a budget looks like. It's exactly just like that. So some things you might uh, see that you're not sure what they are. Okay, we talked about a sales goal. What are your fixed costs? Fixed costs are the ones you're stuck with, whether you have sales or not whether you have a bad month or a good month, you have to pay these bills. This is where your cash flow comes in and this is where people get in trouble. If you're renting a place, you can't go to your landlord and said, look, I'm really sorry, I had a bad month. Unless the landlord's your parents, which they may be nice, but most landlords are just gonna say, mm, sorry, pay your rent. Utilities. They get turned off if you don't pay them. Your phone, your number one piece of equipment that you need, the internet, insurance, all of those things are called fixed costs. And you need to know what they are because they're the things that you have to pay every month. So that's sort of the minimum amount you can make is to cover your fixed costs. Then cost of goods are tied with exactly what your sales are. So I know that for 10 socks, I've got to pay $4.50 or $4.50 a sock. So I know what I've got to buy. My sock maker may say, well, you've got to buy in bulk. I can't sell you 10 a month. You're going to have to buy 50. So now I got to figure something else out, right? But you have to know who's going to, you know, how much is that going to be? What's it going to cost to purchase it? I'm going to put it in a box. Use your five-year-old to put it in the box. You can do that, you know, any of those things. So that's your cost of goods. And then your expenses are the other things like your meals, your meetings, office supplies. These are the things that you don't have to spend the money if you don't have it, right? You don't have to. You don't, you don't have to go have lunch if you don't have any money in the bank, right? So these are the things that are, the, I call them the nice to have. I used to, be criticized because I used, I used to have a receptionist that kind of went crazy with office supplies. She had this thing about pink and purple pens and pink and purple folders. And I finally had to say, we're not. We're buying bland blue and we're buying manila folders and that's it. Because we don't need pink and purple everything for the office. It was an expense that wasn't necessary. So remember those things because who cares if you have purple pens if you can't pay your bills? So you want to think about that. And you will have employees someday that think they should have pink and purple pens. I guarantee it. So then, let's see. And if you'll get those numbers. Oops, hold on. I'm trying to see what this, I can't move us here. There we go. If you'll get those numbers in your head, you're more likely to meet it. Keep them simple. Don't say, oh, I'm going to sell 50 socks in the first month. Keep it simple. Keep it what's doable or you'll get so frustrated. And if you get a number for your monthly expenses in your head, then you're more likely to work to keep your costs down. And you start to get a little selfish and say, I'd like to make a little more money. I'm not going to buy those things that I don't really need. So that's why your numbers are important. And I guarantee if you stay on some of those, you will love it because you'll feel good when you make your numbers 
and you'll work really, really hard when things aren't working and you're down a little bit, you'll work to make those numbers. And it works. So if you need more information or if you would like anything else, I'm always available and uh, I'm happy to help anybody who has questions. So we have questions? Yes, we do have a couple of questions. Um, so I think you may have already answered this because you talked about using Excel. Nicole wanted to know, do you have a suggested template that automates calculations for cash flow? Yes, Excel will do it for you. And uh, if you stick a email or something in the chat for me, or if you want to send me an email, I will, and I will send Donna Lisa that I have an Excel for a budget, and I have one for cash flow, and there are the calculations are built in. So if you have Excel, or you can use it, or copy it, you know, one way or another. But yes. Any of the accounting software will do it. I just, I hate to see people spend the money for accounting software when Excel will do the same trick for you. So Linda, we've got a lot of people putting their emails in the chat. So if you just want to send those to me, I can put those in with the slide deck and our okay. and the replay, and that'll be a lot easier than. I think so. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, don't send them to me. We'll just do it this way. Yeah. And then my information will be there. So if they anyone has more questions, please feel free to contact me. Let me know. Um, let me know who you are and, and where you came from. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely put those in. Okay. Um. So when you were talking about the self-employment tax, Mm -hmm. um, Jane wanted to know if that tax is for corporations as well as a sole proprietor. Uh, no, corporations are supposed to, so if you're a corporation, either a C Corp or an S Corp, the requirement of a corporation is that you would pay yourself a salary or wages, in which case you would be paying, you would be paying payroll taxes. And that is, to a certain extent, the same as paying your self-employment taxes. So you don't pay self-employment taxes if you're a corporation or an S-Corp. But a partnership, if you have a partnership, an LLC, or just a sole proprietor, you must pay self-employment taxes. Okay. Um, and then in the area when you were talking about the meals and the gifts, uh, Marissa wanted to know, can you provide an entertainment gift for an independent consultant or employee? Um, as long as it's $25 or less. Okay. I will give you a couple ideas. I have a couple of realtors that will like give a bottle of wine and a little gift basket when the buyers buy their house. And I suggested that they don't call it a gift, but they go and they get those those bottles of wine with their labels on them or the gift basket with the label on it and it's advertising. And that way they can give the same thing. It's still relatively under $25, but it's also part of their advertising. So it's not entertainment. It doesn't fall into any of those types of things. It has to be all you can write off is $25 or less. Um, if you give a gift of entertainment, let's say I, I want to give somebody, I know they love this concert and I'm going to give them concert tickets. Great. You still can only take $25 of the concert tickets. Okay. Um. So Adrian wanted to know, how do you deduct expenses incurred pre-revenue. So her examples are like research and development, Perfect. manufacturing, legal. Okay. So those would all be considered sort of upfront costs for your business. And if, if you were working with me, we would go through and we would say, okay, are these startup costs? Usually startup costs are a sign uh, and those types of things, or are they um, sort of it, what you need to do to get ready to get started. And then you lump those costs together as a cost for pre-business, if you will, or startup business. And there's certain 
either amortizations that we can take. So they're deductions, but you write them off over time to a certain extent, depending on what they are. Um, but yeah, those are expenses that are legitimate for getting into business. And you wanna keep them, keep track of those. Um, so Alice wanted to know if you have any programs to keep up uh, how to record your expenses. <laughs> I wish I did. Um, so I don't have them. I use I use software. Um, I really I I use Excel. If I if I'm working with someone in a small business, I just enter that. I'll enter it into Excel. The other thing would be. Oh, I didn't say this that I wanted to say. Keep a separate checking account and a separate credit card or debit card. And that'll make it easier for you because then you'll just have one account to look at and you'll see your expenses. But don't co-mingle. And I'll tell you why you don't want to co-mingle. A lot of people will say, oh, I'm going to be an LLC because it gives me some limited liability coverage. Okay, because it's a limited liability and I'm separating myself from my house and my family, right? And my business is separate. If you co-mingle your funds, let's say I use my credit card to buy groceries for my family and it's my business card, I've just broken that veil, that they call it a veil of protection that says, oh, you're not taking your business seriously. You have co-mingled your two and it, and it can cost you uh, credibility with both the IRS, but mostly let's say people they do that because they don't want someone to sue them and take their house. Well, they can sue you and take your house if you commingle and it's shown that you're easily commingling your expenses, personal and business. So you could argue that that means it's all commingled. And you just don't want to do that. So you want separate. And it makes it easier to keep up with your expenses if you have a separate credit card bill and a separate um, bank statement. Makes it a, little, a lot easier. And that's why I just enter from those, that, those items, I just put them in my Excel sheet. Okay, great. Um, so Connie wanted to know, she does hostess gifts and door prizes. Are these considered a write-off? Yes. The door prizes are really advertising and the hostess gifts are gifts and I would just call them gifts and keep track of them. Unfortunately, if they're over $25, you can only deduct $25, but you want to keep track of them as anyways. Um, so I think this would be, so Nicole wanted to know, can you write off providing product samples? Do you claim this? Yes, I claim of, them as advertising. As advertising. I claim samples. I have a, a number of people who have samples, give away samples. And really what you're doing is advertising the product. Okay. Okay. All right. That's all we have time for, for questions. So Linda, thank you you so much for your time and your presentation today. It was excellent. And again, if you send me those templates, I can put them in a folder and make sure everybody gets that. Okay, super. We'll get those to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the mm -hmm. opportunity and best of luck to everyone. Oh, thank you, Linda. I'm sorry. There's one question in here I have to ask you. That's oh, okay. Have. Do you really sell socks? No, I wish. <laughs> no, no. It's just, it was one of those fun things that I found and I found I, I just ran into it and I thought oh these are fun pictures you uh -huh. know? and it's just such a silly thing but I thought oh I could and I immediately thought about the old ladies and you know I just I immediately yeah. put it all together you know so <laughs> I guess I should because <laughs> you know who your market is I, I got it down I'll tell you what so I just, I, it was just one of those things. My imagination went crazy when I put the presentation together. So. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Best of luck, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. You bet. Thank you, Linda.
Okay, ladies, does anybody have any grant-related questions? <laughs> 